Today's video is all about Black Lives Matter. Now, this might be something you may have heard of, but might not know so much about. Um, it's risen to prominence very recently because of the killing of a gentleman in America called George Floyd. He was very unfairly and brutally killed by the police. You may be thinking, why? Police are surely law enforcement. Well, the answer is due to racism. Racism is when people have prejudice directed towards them just because of their race. And Black Lives Matter is all about black people being treated differently to other people just because of the colour of their skin. It seems absolutely bonkers, doesn't it? Can you imagine people being treated differently because of the colour of their hair or the colour of their eyes? It absolutely makes no sense. As people, we are all our brains, essentially. Everything you like, everything you do, it's all governed by your brain. And the casing is our exterior that we have more or less not much influence over. And for people to be judged by something so superficial is absolutely crazy. It also seems mad to think that people in the police might be racist, but people everywhere can have prejudice. Prejudice is all to do with bullying or looking down on or disliking or thinking less of someone just because they might be different to the person being the bully or being racist or prejudiced. It might be they might not like something about the other person, or it might be that they are snobby and judgmental over the other person. There's no reasoning or logic behind the dislike and it really needs stamping out. Wouldn't it be brilliant if we lived in a society with equality where people weren't judged on the colour of their skin or how overweight they are, for example, or the clothes they wear or their accent, how their voice sounds. There are so many different prejudices out there, but racism is one of the most horrific and most extreme. People's differences and cultures should be celebrated because how boring would it be if everyone was the same? How boring would it be if you walked down your local high street and you didn't have Italian pizza for sale next to Mediterranean cuisine and then Middle Eastern cuisine and Indian cuisine and Afro-Caribbean cuisine. You know, there's so much variety that comes from a diverse world and we should embrace it. In the past, in children's literature, there hasn't been the diversity that there perhaps should have been. When I was growing up, it was very rare to find people of colour in the books I read. In fact, still today, there's more animals than there are characters from ethnic minority backgrounds. But books should be representing society so that they can be inclusive of everyone and everyone can feel like they belong. Last week, saw the launch of a pop-up version of the fantastic 500 words competition. And this time, it's called 500 Words Black Lives Matter and here to tell us a little bit more are Angelica Bell and Michael Underwood. Hello, Hello. guys. Hey, Tom. Connie, we love you. <laughs> I love you more, man. How's it all going, by the way? How's lockdown? How's homeschooling? The whole well, shebang. I mean, homeschooling has been a challenge for a couple of reasons. <laughs> I think the main reason is because I'm teaching at the moment. So we're homeschooling our own children and then I'm homeschooling 22 of the children in my class. <laughs> There's a lot of work going on. So if I'm not planning a lesson, luckily Angelica's here because she's absolutely saving the day. She's here Ooh. spending the time with children, which gives me the chance to then spend the time with my 22 children, or my 22 surrogate children, and planning lessons for them. Because for me, it's like a normal school day. I think some parents thought, oh, this is a breeze for teachers. This is a breeze. They've always time off now, along with all their other time off. This is the best thing ever. But actually, it was a lot more work because you suddenly had to plan specifically for this situation. You couldn't just take what you already had on in, and put that in place. You had to start from scratch, so it's a lot of work. I did as well, because it's not, this is going to be, this is a special time for loads of parents have said this to me, that they've actually spent quality time with their children. You've had to be in an environment where you've had to adapt, have to adjust. I mean, there's, there's struggles, ups and downs and different days. But Connie, I know everything about Roman history. <laughs> Seed dispersal. <laughs> I've really, for me, it's been a learning experience in terms of I'm just thinking, why didn't I just focus at school? Because this is actually really cool. Yeah. You know, yeah. and 
everything in hindsight, isn't it? At the time, you're like, oh, another piece of work. <laughs> and then, but then when, when you're an adult, you're like, gosh, you know, there's so much you could learn from that. Oh, that's how to calculate fractions now. The decimal is like that. Get it. Yeah. Yeah. Forty years to date, but I get it. <laughs> it's so true. I actually feel that when you're an adult, you sort of crave knowledge and learning. You know, you'll watch, I don't know, a documentary series on Netflix because you're just so desperate to put information yeah. in your head. But do you think that's because as well, we are now in an era where social media has taken over everything. People don't write anymore. Yeah. People don't take the time to think because everything's fast paced. We're just like, we're not, take time to yeah. think. Whereas you had to do that before. If you had to go and find out a piece of information, you'd have to go search for it. You'd have to walk to the library, yeah. go searching for that book. Then once you've got that book, you made sure you read it because you'd taken all that time to get to the library. And look after it. Because you don't want to have it late or lose it. Oh, fine. Big or trouble. Get a fine. Big trouble. Exactly. But now it's just like, oh yeah, I've done that. Google it. It's so Everything right. is so sort of disposable now, isn't it? It's so transient. Yeah. Whereas like, you know, that thing of valuing something, it's actually quite fun and it feels special. Whereas if you're having things thrown at you, you can't really, take the time out to sort of invest in anything. No, so true. exactly. And so also as well, I thought I've started writing a bit more. And also writing, writing postcards, because you can't see your friends. And I just thought, it's just nice to see your hand, my handwriting more. And, you know, and, even, and having something tangible come through the door is so amazing, you know. So Can I just say, Angelica's handwriting is like one of the most beautiful yes. things you'll ever see. Like most people, it's just a scraggly scorn. Ha Michael, you'll agree. She's just got amazing yeah. handwriting, hasn't yeah. she? But God, I've always said that about you. We are quite, we like the flowy letters and, you know, long, you know, I think that says something about our personalities. Probably it's crazy. We like mind, we're, mind creatives. we're creatives. We're creatives. <laughs> and crazy as well. Which brings me actually quite nicely onto the Black Lives Matter 500 words competition, which you two are both fronting so tell us a bit about how did that come about chris actually came to our house and he was, wow. he was like i've got i've got this idea you know the mm. bbc let 500 words go he is passionate about it because obviously it was his baby 10 years ago and he's the yes. one who's behind it um and he really wanted it to carry on and he thought look i had this idea what do you guys think and it was funny because the way he delivered it was he felt like he wasn't qualified to discuss it because he wanted this theme of Black Lives Matter and he wanted to just have a chat and to see what people, what black people thought about it. And he said, what do you think? We thought it's a brilliant idea. If it gets children talking and if it raises the awareness with them, then 100% we're behind it. We love it, Chris. Like you said about, you know, young children and their personalities are developing when they're young and stuff. And I think that's why this is so important because they're the next generation. And their ideas are going to form the world on loads of things, whether it's climate change, um, race, mm -hmm. um, how they feel about um, mental health, all those things are so vital. And I think maybe we underestimate how much power they have and how sometimes we can learn from children. So if we get them now, let them express themselves, hear their rhetoric on it, it will only stand them in good stead when they get older and also help them. Because if you learn to express yourself in any form, whether that's writing, um, sport, um, you know, other things, you'll be able to to navigate your way through other issues that will come up as you get older, because you'll be like, okay, if writing's the way I can communicate with myself or with other people, then I'll put pen to paper. If it's just getting out there and being physical and physically active, then that's what I'll do. So it's teaching children as well, a skill which they can use and can be translated into other areas of their lives as they get older. Yeah, Michael, how have the kids at your school sort of received it? And what did they know about Black Lives Matter? And also, what did both of your children, what did they know about the whole thing before? As a teacher with my class, I've always encouraged them to discuss and have opinions. Whatever the topic is, if it's the topic of that week that's in the news, then I bring it out and we have a special lesson where it's an hour long lesson. And I just encourage them, what do you think about this topic? Yeah. And we just put in their ideas. And obviously, you know, children, what they lack in experience, they make up for in honesty, that's for sure. Yeah. And they'll just say, it. And sometimes it might be a misconception, but you to but they're able to almost support the misconception. So they sort of explain why they think what they think. And then it sort of falls on me to sort of say, well, yes, but have a look. This is actually what this is about. And this is what, and you put both sides to them. And sometimes I even break them up into a debate. And so they believe this and th you believe that. But Mr. Rundle, I don't think that. No, you don't. But you need to be able to see from someone else's point of view. You need to be able to have, and that comes back to the empathy that you were talking about, Com. And it's so important to get that into children because they do find empathy quite tricky. 
It is quite a tricky concept in many ways for a young child, but if you can break it down in, in a way that they understand it, it's really powerful. And I think that's what it's been with Black Lives Matter. They know it's there. I mean, a lot of them came up with, but we're not black. And, yeah. it's, <laughs> and I sort of say, I totally get where you're coming from and you're right, you're not. But I said, mm -hmm. you can still have an opinion on something and you can still have you know, a, an opinion on fairness. Is it right that one person, one child is treated fairer than the other child? Is that, is, should it be like that? What do you think? And you just start a discussion like that. So they've been very positively reacting to it. And um, yeah, I really, really love hearing all of their opinions on these major topics because it's just so fresh about it. Well, some of them not aware, because it is a bit like saying to a child, some people are treated differently because they have blue eyes. Because mm. children don't see these things, but they might yeah. say, mummy, why is your skin brown? But similarly, they might go, mummy, why is that person got blonde hair and that person got brown hair? Or, you know, mummy, why does someone live in a bigger house or a small house? You know, they ask questions with honesty, but there's, yeah. there's no prejudice involved unless no. adults put it upon them or create a picture yeah. for them. <laughs> Thing. And of course, you can't expect children to understand about the last 400 years of black history and, and understand all of the things that have gone on. Or, you know, I'm not expecting an eight year old to understand what systemic prejudice or systemic racism is. <laughs> you can't expect that. It's a very difficult concept for many adults to really sort of take on board. But what you can do is you can just talk to them very openly and you can explain to them. I, I kept, I use this sort of um, narrative of you say to one, if I said to a child, swim two lengths of the swimming pool and I'll give you a bag of chocolate. But I say to the next child, swim four lengths of the swimming pool and I'll give you a bag of chocolate. You know, hang on a minute, but why should I have to swim further to get the same bag of chocolate? And it's, yeah. that is a great answer for the children. So you don't have to worry about, so parents do worry about what to say to their children about it. Don't stress about getting into 400 years of black history straight away. Just ease them in with something that they will absolutely be able to understand immediately. And also I think as adults, you know, Connie, we've all worked in children's telly and one thing we like to do is be open, we'll let children yeah. be open and feel they can ask questions. You know, mm. I've got some friends, um, children who happily will say, oh, you're, you're brown or you're black. I'm like, yeah. And I'll just say, what do you think about it? And yeah. you know, let them speak, you know, without letting them feel awkward and stuff. I'm like, yeah, different. What, you know, what do you like about yourself? What, you know, yeah. I'll say, what do you like about myself? Yeah. So it's just making it open. A perfect example is with our own children. Just a couple of weeks ago, we were going to see some friends who were a gay couple, and in the car, they just said, are oh, so-and-so and so-and-so married? Uh, yes, they are. But they're two men. Yes, well, men can get married. Two men, two women, and a man and woman, they can all get married. And they went, oh, okay. okay. Yeah. That's, that. that's it. End of conversation. That's end of conversation. It's brilliant, and that's yeah. what's so refreshing about children, is that they don't have that prejudice, they don't have that cynicism, they just see it as, okay, that's the way it is. What did you, what yeah. did you think, Connor, about the writing competition? Well, I just think it's a brilliant way to bring sort of inclusivity and diversity in, in that, in a weird way, it flip reverses it. So lots of people were sort of like, can only black people enter this competition? Because like Michael was saying, a, a white person might think, well, this doesn't affect me. And it's, it's that thing of, well, actually, now it's sort of flipped the other way. But actually, of course, because the whole point of inclusivity is we want everyone to be involved and yeah. everyone to put their take on it. Everyone's got a unique take on something. Yeah. So, you know, if you are, say, the only white person in a scenario, and or if you're the only black person in a scenario, it's still the same thing. You feel like an outsider. And similarly, if you're a child growing up in a village where there aren't many ethnic minorities, then you might be more interested and that might be your story. You might what, yeah, feel, yeah. you know, and that's a unique story. And, and um, the whole thing is, is all about what, what you both said. It's just about prejudice. So this is the stepping stone to write an amazing story about prejudice. And it might be metaphorical. It might be a planet on which certain yeah. aliens are treated differently or whatever. I think people often think, oh, I have to write something heavy and full on. But like you say, with children, you can take it back to that simplicity because yeah. they don't carry the baggage that we do, essentially. Yeah, totally. Um, they could be writing about aliens on space and one alien might feel that they don't feel included. And yeah. then... I don't like the purple aliens. Yeah. 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 It's, it's just green aliens that stay together. Yeah. Those purple ones are weird. <laughs> yeah, totally. So, um, yeah. Never judge a book by its cover. And that's exactly what this is. That's what it is. Just because you see a black person across the road and it's quite dark at night and you're, you're worried about whether you should cross the road or not, don't judge it. You can't do that. 
don't do it like that. You can't just assume that every black person you see at night is potentially going to mug you. You can't make those assumptions. And I think sometimes it's very easy for a certain side of society to think that because that unfortunately seems to be the, the image that maybe has been portrayed. Society p portrays its own stereotypes and then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy yeah. because for instance, it's harder to get a job, for instance, if you've got the same credentials as someone that's white, for example, and so then suddenly, you know, you might get a knock in confidence by that many rejections and then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Or, mm. for instance, in America, you know, one in three black people is put in jail. Why? Because of the institutionalized corrupt, you know, arrests for loitering or something. And then people will make the stats, they confuse the causation and result. And, and that is this, this whole thing of systemic problems. That's that right. Make more problems. It's that link as well, Connie, isn't it, between education, poverty, and crime, and that yeah. that's the other thing. There's an absolute link, a proven link between you know a lack of education leading to poverty, and then poverty leading to crime, and then so you're right from yeah. the start. You feel like there's certain sections of society that are hobbled from the very yeah. beginning, and that's their path almost started to be carved yeah. out. And what I always say is, life is a lottery. Any one of us could have been born in Syria, in a war, or in a famine, or, you know, we didn't predetermine where yeah. we ended up, it's luck. So it's important to reach down the ladder and pull other people up mm -hmm. when you manage to sort of get up that ladder. Um, guys, this has been absolutely fascinating. There's, there's two days left for people to enter yes. 500 yes. Words Black Lives Matter. Just quickly tell us how. Okay, well, the first thing you need to do is go to the website, 500words.me, so 500words.me. Um, all of the details are there, including the link which allows you to upload your piece of work. So there's two age groups, uh, there's five to nine and 10 to 13. And remember, the key thing is 500 words, not one word more. 500 words or less on yeah. the theme of Black Lives Matter. Brilliant. Thank you so much, gang. You have been awesome to talk to. <laughs> I love talking to you, yeah, Connie. Yeah, brilliant, Connie. We, we've been on the phone for three hours once. Yeah, to be fair, we could, this could have been like Probably a more. six hour <laughs> podcast. You just talked for six hours, non-stop. Yeah, I could quite happily, we should do that. Let's start a podcast after this. Okay. Marathon, a marathon, marathon podcast. podcast. Yes. Oh my goodness, I uh -oh. love it. That's the other good thing about yeah. chatting to you. Ideas, <laughs> ideas come through. Brilliant, yeah, worrying. Um, thank you so much, gang, and I will catch you soon. Yeah. And lots okay, of love. Thank Take you. Care. Bye. The brilliant Michael Underwood and Angelica Bell. Now, people should always be proud of who they are, their culture, their history and their stories. And our next author has written his book because he felt that lots of Zambian children growing up in the UK might not know about their background or their culture. There are 13 different languages in Zambia and it's been translated into each and every one of them. I'm going to read the English translation, but the book that I'm reading from is also in Pemba, the most popular of the Zambian languages. A Family Adventure by Chanju Mwanza. We're going on an adventure through memory lane, diving through the photos on grandma's window pane. There's mummy with Auntie Womba and cousin Malou, and grandpa stands by their side, waiting in a queue. Then there's Uncle Chulwe, rolling his Nishima into balls, and Grandma leaps for a mango, catching it as it falls. My big sister is an athlete and runs really far, and my baby brother, Chimwemwi, smiles while playing with his car. The old dog, Bingo, eats a juicy chicken bone, and our teacher, Auntie Mabeta, smiles while talking on the phone. The builder, Uncle Koombo, adds metal sheets to the schools and mummy fixes the broken down car with her brand new tools. Daddy feeds baby Katongo and reads him a great big book and auntie Melita poses to show off her brand new look. Right at the end there's a photo of us all together and that's my beautiful family and I'll love them all forever. A Family Adventure There by Chanju Mwanza. Hope you enjoyed this video. If so, then please subscribe and spread the word. But that's it for now. See you next time. Bye.